So I'm going to talk about blue tides, which is a cosmological simulation of structural formation um, that we've been running. Um, here is uh, Yu Fang, who's just uh, right there, and I want to put him on the spot as much as possible because he's really um, the one who's uh, run blue tides, so he's been that deeply embedded in this blue stuff. Okay, <laughs> he's done all the coding and uh, and uh, all the fantastic progress with this project. So um, so please talk to him as well. He's uh, nicely dressed. He has a haircut. Uh <laughs> That's quite. <laughs> Okay, so um, so this is sort of the culmination of uh, a large project that we be we have embarked ourselves with. So we started trying to do very large cosmological simulations. So try and do the largest chunks of the universe that we can fit in anything that we have currently available. Okay, and I'll tell you a little bit why we may want to try and do that, um, not just to do the biggest thing all the time. Um, so um, I'll get to that in a second. So there are other simulations, very large cosmological boxes that we ran. Those were done wi on Kraken. And just to give you an idea of scales, and I'm going to refer back a little bit to this, um, these were um, uh, volumes that are um, a few hundred megaparsecs. So these are very sizable pieces of the universe um, on the side. So um, cube this for the volume. Um, they were run to re different redshifts uh, for uh, mostly because of computational time. Um, there's a so you can evolve the universe uh, to some uh, more or less and still get a lot of science done. Obviously, eventually you want to evolve the universe to, to all the way to today in some of the runs, so the redshift is zero so in some of these runs to make sure that uh, you understand what the universe is like today so that you can compare to it. Okay, so these were um, what I'm going to be referring to, to Massive Black or Massive Black 2 from time to time so as a sort of comparison. Um, the kind of simulations that um, we've em embarked into are uh, contain um, so th the full gravity uh, solvers that we have. So this is done um, uh, with the uh, PN grid and tree codes at different scales. And they're also hydrodynamic simulations. So they have um, cooling uh, and volu um, uh, physics that uh, tells us about star formations, um, what stars do to the to the interstellar medium as well, and also they follow the growth of black holes. So they're sort of full physics uh, universes. So we're trying to really predict uh, what the universe looks like in all of its aspects, not just dark matter, which has, of course, benefits in themselves and has been done a lot in the field. So. Blue tides, uh, where does it sit in, in sort of in comparison? So again, um, we have the same code that is the cosmological code uh, gadget, but we've evolved it. We evolved it a lot to do the previous simulations in order to run at scales on machines such as Kraken on the full machines. Now we've evolved it into this version of MP gadget um, to uh, actually be able to um, Wor work at scales of on blue waters. So now we are at scales where we have about um, uh, a trillion particles. Uh, we're still trying to do pretty large sizable volumes as much as we can. And um, we've run this on blue water uh, to still redshift eight. Um, I'm going to try and convince Rudy to give me enough time to go to seven, but he'd probably say no. <laughs> but this is mostly limited. It's actually, it's uh, working really well. But um, it's just limited by the allocation. Okay, so we are still a pre-unevolved universe, but uh, that's fine. We have interesting things we can do there as well. Um, in terms of the data sizes, uh, each snapshot from the simulation is about 50 terabytes, and we have approaching 100 of the snapshots from the simulation. So there's a lot of data that goes on in there. So these computations again um, have the full physics. Uh, so there's uh, gravity, there's hydrodynamics, there's star formation, there's feedback, black hole. That we also put in um, a simple model for patch reionization. Um, this is a bit for the specialized, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more maybe in a little bit. Okay, so we're running on um, blue water on about 700 K cores, so it's close to the full machine. So wha what is this craziness? Wha why are we trying to run on this, you know, this humongous thing? Um, sorry, this is not coming out properly. So this is um, uh, what I'm trying to show here is sort of the history of this field a little bit. So this should be um, up here is the mass 
that we achieve per resolution element, the mass per particle plotted as a function of year as hydrodynamic, this is just a hydrodynamic cosmological simulation. So um, as the mass per resolution element was very large early on, what we were able to um, really uh, simulate was the largest structure in the universe, the big clusters of galaxies. So that's how this field sort of starts. Um, and uh, as we move on um, towards uh, today, we are now able to simulate simultaneously all the structures that are actually present in the universe, from the largest cluster of galaxies down to pretty much dwarf galaxy sizes. So the idea here is to, can we actually um, resolve and form the whole universe and all the structures that it contains uh, self-consistently, ab initio, um, and sort of that's where we are driving toward and facilities like Blue Waters are making this possible, sort of resolving the full mass function of the kind of structures that we observe in the universe. At least we can attempt to go there. Okay, sorry about that, but okay, so uh, we are getting to um, masses, resolutions that are good enough for us to get enough information about the rich hierarchy of objects that we see in the universe. If you translate this in um, how big are the runs getting in order for us to achieve that in a cosmological volume, so this is the number of particles per year from the beginning, okay, where um, this is in log, but there's uh, not many particles there, to th what we are running today, uh, we're approaching the trillion particles to for the kind of resolutions um, that we need in order to be able to get the full mass functions of the structures that we want to look at. So this is kind of the idea uh, behind this, and what this also s shows us uh, is that the algorithms are being, you know, they follow Moore's law. You know, the machines are getting bigger. We are able to keep up with it. So, and that's pretty much what we need to do as we move to these larger, larger calculations. Always, um, and is a core part of this program, uh, of course, to try and make our, our codes work at scales at these large facilities, and therefore do all the physics that we are interested in doing. So I'll give you just a, a, a brief update, and uh, is again, you is there, so he's worked on a lot of this, if you have questions later for him as well, on what has happened to this new version of this cosmological code in order to be able to uh, work well on blue water. Uh, so um, one thing that we noticed um, so uh, was uh, some uh, problems in the short-range force calculations. So uh, the code was already fully threaded um, when, as we were working on um, uh, Kraken, but uh, what we are seeing here is that when we go to number of threads that are more appropriate for the scales that we have in blue water and the kind of system that blue water is, um, so above roughly 10 threads or so, we saw significant slowdown here. So basically what we saw is that um, uh, as thre threads are trying to drift the same particle at the same time, there's a significant slowdown uh, for large number of threads that can actually be um, uh, beaten down a lot by replacing uh, some uh, global critical sections with spins locks, so per particle locks, so um, uh, we don't suffer this problem of particles interfering with each other when they're, they're being drifted, and also atomic increment operations. So this was one of the things that uh, meant that uh, we could move to large number of threads effectively, um, and uh, with, in fact, a speed up by a factor of two, roughly. Uh, also, so that was is uh, in the short range, which affects actually many parts of the code, but also in the long range force calculations. So in the we actually had to move completely to a new PM solver, uh, particle mesh solver. So um, uh, Gadget and other codes, but Gadget was u making use of FFTW um, to calculate uh, forces in the uh, in the PM regime. So now we move to a pencil building domain. So FFTW works in slabs, and uh, this is an example of what would happen. So uh, for eight processes, when um, you cut this uh, uh, domain in four slabs, you're still having four idle processes. Obviously, with a pencil beam, you're fine, and um, you're actually making much better use, effective use of uh, your um, uh, domain decomposition on the type of machine. Now we are on 10,000 slabs as well on 18,000 MPM ranks. So this becomes a really big effect. So going from F FFTW in slabs to pencil beam domain decomposition gave us a factor of eight speed up. 
um, in the cause. So that was a very, very significant step and Im pretty much impossible not to take at these scales. Uh, there's other subtleties. Okay, thanks. Other subtleties as well within um, uh, also the domain decomposition and how you can build uh, the tree. Um, here um, is just a way of, implement of implementing how uh, the, the, the tree is being built. And um, uh, this can make a lot of difference uh, in the way in, in which you could render the communication to the absolute bare minimum when you're doing a one-to-one -one, um, uh, basically communication from children to its root ranks in each sub-communicator and only, uh, only at the end followed by a global broadcast. So again, you um, communication at this very large number of cores uh, becomes a really big deal and uh, things like that make a significant differences. So there's also a new MPSOAR algorithm that was worked on and uh, this impacts a lot of the I.O., the way we store, we write out and store the data um, uh, as I'm running out of time. There was actually uh, you and Mark Straka, um, Straka and, uh, and CSA, they, they got a paper accepted at uh, the Cray uh, user group conference and about this. And this is just an example of how it works. So that is also something that made a, a real difference in how we write the data. So sort of summarizing, we made some significant progress both in the short range force, long range force, the global domain tree, and friends of friends through uh, the sorting algorithm in, in the way we, you know, we've optimized now. Um, say in this case, we plot the world clock time per step. Um, and the decrease from the version of the code that was used in uh, the largest Kraken run to now moving to Blue Waters. So um, we are really um, now uh, running uh, very successfully. And even though we've actually added a lot of physics as well, so um, we want to worry about the first objects that form. Uh, we actually introduced some um, newer um, formalism for the hydrodynamics. Um, H2 molecular cooling. We actually added some, a model for patch reionization so that we can follow the neutral hydrogen as a function of uh, time. Um, and uh, some uh, details in how um, uh, the supernova energy is being uh, ejected. So just to give you some sample of uh, results, one of the things that um, it's fun to use this very large volume with is to uh, look at that early universe and say, okay, what is uh, what are the first galaxies um, like that form there? This is just um, actually the um, field of view of these blue tight simulations compared here in this uh, box down here to what is currently observed. So it's very exciting that today th with the legacy fields of the Hubble Space Telescope, we are starting to see galaxies at very, very high redshift, uh, redshifts eight to nine to 10, but um, uh, this observation is extremely deep and in very, very narrow regions of the sky. So that's to give you an idea, that's the amount of universe that we see for the very first um, galaxy, the oldest galaxies that have formed in the universe. And um, now this is the kind of um, field of view that uh, large simulations can have. So what are we seeing? What, is f um, what kind of prediction can we make um, aside these uh, galaxies? Well, the simulations, first of all, predict the kind of star formation rate um, as a function of redshift that is expected at this redshift. So you can make a plot of what we call the star formation rate density as a function of time, where this is early universe. This is about 500 million years, so um, uh, which is roughly consistent. This is the prediction from blue water there. Um, and of course, you can make prediction for what the upcoming surveys like W first, which indeed are going to look at deeper and larger volumes, are going to see. Thanks. And, and then sort of zoom in into our volume and find all of the galaxies that have formed. There's uh, many of them. Uh, this has been done through um, basically creating a mock simulation, basically a mock field. And the galaxies were found by source extract. That is the same way like the observers do. And build yourself uh, luminosity functions. This is uh, the number of galaxy, the differential number of galaxies is a function of the luminosity. And this is in some astronomy units where the more negative is the brighter the galaxy is. Okay, so this is in magnitudes. Um, and these are the predictions of the blue water uh, simulation in blue and in red, actually, uh, compared to uh, current observational constraints. There are these black points on there. And uh, yeah, what we see is that. 
there is some consistency, which is very promising, but also um, there's a, of course, as I said, these volumes that have been observed as very small, so there are a lot of galaxies that are yet to be observed and are yet to be um, discovered, particularly at the very bright end. We also have a model for quasars um, and black hole growth, so we can make prediction for that. Um, and I'll talk, I won't have time to talk about this. So what are these very first galaxies like? So there's a, a lot, the universe is very dense, it's collapsing very fast. So even observations, this is from the simulations that are actually, but even observations are hinting that these galaxies are very clumpy, very disturbed. Um, but again, the, the ones that are sort of small galaxies that are being observed in very small volume. When we go and look at regions, and this is again from the blue tide simulation, and regions around where the most massive galaxies that are yet to be observed uh, look like, we find in fact that this is the gas component, but when we're looking at the star co stellar component, these galaxies are amazingly disky, like uh, Milky Way type, very compact, but actually disky, and very ordered, which is kind of fun. So the very first galaxies, the most massive first galaxies that form, are actually sort of equivalent compact Milky Way-like objects, um, rather than a clumpy, messy thing. Okay, so this is the kind of predictions that we were able to make for these. This is just another rendering of that. Um, some of the uh, most massive galaxies, uh, in fact, the majority of them have rather turbulent, but still disky structure when you go and measure those. This is um, looking at the star formation rate, so the UV flux, so what would be more observed. They have these kind of holes. This is due to a lot of dust in the center of this that we're trying to uh, make some simple models of. So we are hoping this guides observations for JWST and upcoming surveys of this kind to look for these. This is again um, uh, looking at what's currently being observed. This is the size of galaxies, and again, as a function of luminosity, this is the bright end of galaxies. Uh, currently, we are only seeing the very faint ones, and we are predicting that we should see these disky objects, massive objects, as we are able to finally probe larger volume of the early universe and these first galaxies. Um, so these first galaxies are also responsible for what we call reionization of the universe. So if we look at, here we start with the Big Bang, um, the universe is, is completely dark and neutral, and as the first galaxies switch on, um, they start lighting up this universe, but, and their photons are actually able to ionize, reionize the neutral hydrogen that is in there. This is the epoch of reionization that we are again going to be studying with future surveys, and uh, we're starting to probe. And the manager question is, what actually does the organization, where are most of the photons coming? They're coming from galaxies and probably these quasars that are there, but what fraction is uh, being contributed by what? So we can start looking at these questions with this kind of simulation. So if this up here, this should be the total photons required uh, for uh, the total photons, and this is the number of photons required as a function of redshift to do the reionizations. This is the contribution from galaxies and AGN for different assumptions for how many photons actually escape galaxies and AGN. Okay, so um, the conclusion for from uh, the blue tide simulation is that you can definitely reionize the universe with galaxies, but um, there is likely, it's just borderline basically, and in some assumptions, AGN will contribute uh, very significantly, if not more. So um, currently, um, the requirement is that the photons from galaxies have to escape at a very, um, with a large fraction, um, otherwise, yeah, AGN are going to have to contribute more. But certainly, AGN can contribute at the very highest redshift. Okay, so I've run out of time, um, and uh, so I kind of stop there. And while I, I do that, um, and maybe somebody asks a question, I'm going to show you another viewer that we uh, you fang set up with the robotics at CMU. Um, this is some sort of called the Gigapan software. So it's, uh, sorry, I'm kind of, um, it's kind of fun. But yeah, uh, I'll stop at this. I mean maybe as the questions are being asked, I'll show how you can pan and find galaxies through this viewer. It's an interactive viewer, which is very fun for this visualization and very instructive also to find things. But yeah, sorry. <laughs>